people that um, I've talked to that can't make it to the meeting, so they would appreciate seeing that afterwards. Yeah. So um, really quick, we're just going to have um, participants stay on mute status uh, through uh, going through the slides at the beginning here. And then depending on how many people show up into the, um, the meeting, we could open it up to um, just being able to hop in and, and chat. It just becomes, if you've got more than about 10 people, it kind of becomes chaotic. So um, we'll just see how it goes with how many people join us for the conversation. Um, and so, Ronnie, did you want to ask your question and then people can chime in now about that, those two questions you wanted to start it off and kick it off with? So I want to know if uh, folks are new to uh, ruminants and this is like an educational piece to like informing their decisions if they're going to do it. Um, and then if you're specific to goats or sheep or both. So if you feel comfortable jumping in and talking, go for it. Otherwise, there's a chat feature on the bottom. You can click the box that says chat and you can type your answer in there and we can read them. I've got two pygora goats and three alpacas. Okay. Are you doing fiber then? Yeah, I'm actually knitting as we're going here. Okay. Um, are you familiar with the Twisted Straight Fiber Co-op? Yep, I'm already a member. Sat on the board awesome. for a year and a half. Awesome. Okay. Very good. Do you spin or do fiber arts or are you just wanting to be a producer? Uh, I spin and, and then I create uh, clothing, hats, scarves, whatever from the fiber. Awesome. That's great. Cool. Very cool. Okay, anybody else want to share? If you're on, you may be on mute if you. Hi. Hi. We have, I'm Valerie. We have a small flock of um, Katadin sheep. So their hair sheep we're using as um, pasture maintenance and meat. This is our first year having them. We're almost at a year. We just did our first lambing season, which was super fun. And um, so my husband and I are here just to learn more about the community and see what else we can do with these guys. Nice. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, so we've heard from Valerie, we've heard from Molly Durham. Is it Durham? Dyram. Dyram. Hi, Dyram. Do you guys want to Hello. share at all? Um, we're pretty new. I've worked with goats a little bit. Um, we're going to get a couple. Most of my experience has been with chickens and pigs and a dog who acts like a goat. But <laughs> that's that's my experience. Great. Pretty much. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for sharing and for joining us. Um, did we hear from Tammy? I don't know if Tammy wants to share or pop it in the chat. Um, so Ronnie, for those that just joined us, there's a couple more that hopped on. Um, do you want to ask them to just pop it in the chat, those two questions, and repeat the questions? Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious to know if you're here to learn about goats or sheep, and if you're experienced or new. So we'll go ahead and uh, ask you guys to go ahead and pop that in the chat, and then Ronnie can get started on kind of moving through. I'm just going to be facilitating. So my name is Jess Sappington and I am with the WSU uh, Kitsap Extension and I work part of my time with WSU Regional Small Farms Program. Um, so this uh, Dirt Talk event series is really, it's a brand new series that we're doing and we were supposed to kick it off in March with an in-person awesome um, networking event at Ronnie's farm in her new historic, her newly preserved historic barn. Um, and unfortunately COVID happened and life happened. And so we had to cancel that, but we were still super excited because we were getting feedback and questions from um, new and beginning farmers and others in the community about this event series. So we wanted to find a way to still be able to share out and um, bring people together to talk about this um, topic. And so Ronnie um, agreed generously to uh, host with me this um, virtual meeting of sorts so that you guys could still connect and network. Um, 
So I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware that this event, um, it is hosted by WC Regional Small Farms in conjunction with the Kitsap Community and Agricultural Alliance. And for those of you who are not familiar with Kitsap Community and Agricultural Alliance, uh, KCAA, it is our local agricultural alliance organization. Um, and they are uh, supporters of farmers and they help build community and strengthen the local food system. Um, on the Kitsap Peninsula. It's free to be a member, so if you're not already a member, I would uh, highly uh, uh, encourage you to go to their website and just become a member. You'll get all the updates and different events that are happening that they do. Um, but I wanted to point out that this uh, Dirt Talk series is really a way for um, farmers to come together, new farmers, old farmers, people who are thinking about farming um, to come together and network and, and all around a topic that they might have shared interest in. So um, they're not classes intended, intended to further your knowledge in any type of academic topic or setting, but they're more an opportunity for you guys as a community of farmers to get together and bounce ideas off each other hear from other farmers that have been there, done that. Um, and so that is why we kind of created this series. So um, this is the very first one. So again, thank you for joining us. And thank you, Ronnie, for, for being gracious enough to uh, host this topic of small ruminants and bird tourism. So I just want to introduce Ronnie for those of you who do not know her. She is a local food advocate here in Kitsap. Um, she is actually a former KCA board member as well. Um, she is owner and operator along with her husband, Aaron, of the Smithshire um, up in North Kitsap. And they raise fruit, produce, sheep and dairy goats. And they recently started expanding out into agritourism by launching their goat yoga program, which has been super exciting and is part of what Ronnie can share with you guys today. Um, we wanted to have a disclaimer on here that she's not a veterinarian. She's just an experienced farmer who's willing to share her knowledge and information with you guys um, and kind of help guide you through her own farm experience and knowledge. Um, so again, uh, the presentation and resource guide, hopefully you guys all got that resource guide on my reminder email yesterday. Um, that's in, really intended for you to just make your best decisions and always seek advice of a licensed veterinarian for best results but I know that Ronnie is also able and willing to help you um, help guide you with information as well beyond this. She's really great in that way. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Ronnie to uh, start the presentation and discussion. Okay, everybody, thanks for coming. I hope you've had a chance to review the resource packet and that you have some questions and some areas that you wanna discuss. Um, so today, it's like Jess said, it's just going to be a really a, a broad discussion on raising ruminants, and um, we hope that at the end that you'll be able to understand uh, their needs and if there's something that is would be appropriate for you to, you know, be include in your in your life. Um, I um, really want to emphasize the fact that these are sentient beings and that we really are in control of every aspect of their life. Um, their happiness, their health, their well-being, and so it's um, it's a lot of uh, responsibility on us to be owners. And so I hope that you will um, take that into consideration um, if you are planning to get animals, or if if you already have animals. That um, if they're not happy, then um, there's something that you can hopefully that you can do about it. So, um, yeah, I I think that's all I want to say on that point we can go ahead and pop right into the topics of discussion. So the first area that we're gonna talk about is, um, you know, the breeding, birthing, general animal care, animal health. All right, well, we're gonna talk about breeding. So um, you can see some instructions here that if you have some questions or you wanna raise your hand, um, or you can type them into the chat box and Jess will go ahead and facilitate those things for us. Um, so uh, if, you have, if you have certain areas that you wanna discuss, you know, under the topic as we go through each topic. Let's go ahead and start there. Um, I'm not gonna just like read through these things or go through them if there's some certain things that, um, if we don't have anything to talk about in that area, I might just bring up some things just to uh, maybe see if it can stimulate some conversation. But um, yeah, I think that's where we're gonna go. So of course, breeding is one of those things that um, depending on what your purpose is, whether you're doing it for milk or because you wanna have more animals, um, it's 
it's a very important and essential piece and health is of the utmost and um, importance. Um, you've got to make sure that your body is in good, the animals are in good condition, not just the females, but the males also. A lot of people think that they can have a buck or a ram and just feed it hay and, and breed them once a year and he's good to go. But the truth is that they require a lot more nutrition during their breeding time, including the selenium and vitamin E. Um, they need those things for sperm production and they, to be able to maintain a healthy, um, you know, virility. So, um, and I've, you know, there's some information in here about, um, about all of that information and the CDT shots. Uh, I don't really CDT everybody, but I definitely like to CDT the boys before they go into their rut because um, they're just so pumped and full of testosterone that they don't really know if they get hurt. So it's good to make them protected. Um, we actually had one of our rams step on a nail and I noticed him limping and I was like, what are you doing? And so I checked it out and sure enough, he had a nail in his foot and I gave him a booster and I gave him a dose of antibiotics. Well, first I called my veterinarian um, to make sure what I should do. Um, but so it's always good to have a relationship with the veterinarian, uh, make sure that you feel comfortable with them and that they know a little bit about you before you get um, going too far. Uh, emergencies always suck. And it's, um, it gives you a bit of confidence to know that you've got somebody there that has your back. So um, if you can create a relationship in a healthy way before you need the emergency, I highly recommend that. So um, anyways, with that being said, is there any questions about uh, the prep, pre preparing to breed an animal? I don't see anybody typing in the chat, but I want to just make sure everybody knows that this is really a time for you to ask questions and bounce ideas. And so if you do have questions, it would be great um, to kind of get that because somebody else in the chat or in the um, meeting might also have that same type of a question. So it might be beneficial. Um, and don't be shy. Again, this is a networking event. It's not, it's not us trying to talk at you. It's really more of um, sharing that information out to people who need it. So um, no pressure if you don't have a question, it's okay. Ronnie has lots of information she can figure out. <laughs> yeah, so I guess we can open up to any of the questions that are on the board right now, whether it's preparing to breed prenatal care or feeding uh, before and during pregnancy. Um, There's a few pieces of prenatal care that are important. The selenium vitamin E gel before you actually put the, your, uh, your breeder animal, your male in with your females. You want to make sure that they have that selenium vitamin E gel in on board beforehand. And then also um, you'll do that a few more times when it gets closer to delivery, which is in the, the guide also. Um, the selenium vitamin E gel, uh, especially here in Washington state, we're low in selenium um, because we just get so much water, it just runs out and uh, you can get very nerdy on the science of all of these things. Like you have to have boron in order for certain things to absorb. And so um, you can really do a lot of research into it if you want to. I, I find that it's just helpful just to use the gel. I know other people have done other things. For myself, I know um, I actually have some selenium drops that I got from an online site so that I definitely dose their water with that and also iodine throughout the season just a few times here and there um just to make sure i iodine just seems to be something that everybody's lacking whether it's human or animals so um you know you don't want to overdo anything but um yeah i definitely make sure those things are on board selenium is very important as far as cell development goes um and also when it comes time to for delivery the selenium and the vitamin E both help with that sac pliability. They keep it strong, but they also make it so that um, once the baby comes out, the sac can be broken. Uh, this is especially important if, it's, if the mom ends up delivering on her own and you're not there to help get the baby out to her. You don't want that baby to um, struggle in there. Once that umbilical cord breaks free from the mother, that baby's no longer getting oxygen. And so, um, you got to get that area cleaned off right away and get the baby on its own respiratory path right away. So, um, yeah. 
any questions about anything else? I know the resource guide's pretty in depth, so hopefully you'll get what you need out of there if you don't have questions right now. We're gonna move on to birthing then. I know you were talking about breeding, so we'll move on to the next step, birthing. Unless somebody does have a question, feel free to just pop in. There's not too many people on the line. I think we could just do it as they come. Okay. Uh, so the birthing um, the section in the book about the birthing kit, the birthing kit is um, really important. Of course, you don't need all of these things, but uh, I find it important to have a lot of these items. I definitely, the suction is probably, the suction and the towels are probably the most important piece, along with something to uh, cut the umbilical cords and absolutely the iodine for the dip um, and the selenium vitamin E gel. Uh, all those things are definitely worth having. Um, and and things to help with ketosis. Those are also important also. Luckily we haven't had that situation, but we also give the um, the uterine tonic tea after they've delivered. And I think that molasses, you know, it's a quick sugar. They need it, they want it, they think it's yummy. Um, a lot of our girls after they deliver, they're looking for that they're looking for that uh, stock pot. They want it. <laughs> so, and uh, it's surprising how much they'll drink. They say that a goat will drink a gallon of water a day and they'll drink a gallon pretty much right there. So um, we find that to be real helpful. And luckily we haven't had any problems with retained placentas. So, and it also is helpful um, day of um, if you have a gal that you know she's had problems with delivery before, maybe her cervix doesn't ex uh, doesn't dilate appropriately. I know I have one girl that every year she freaks me out, and I have to manually, um, you know, massage and open that cervix area. And I started giving her the uterine tonic beforehand. I still had to massage her this year, but that's probably because I didn't get her the uterine tonic out in time to when she was going to deliver. But um, yeah. So I encourage that. Um, if no one has any questions, I'll just kind of keep going down the list and just talk about the things that are on my mind. So birthing paddock prep, um, we like to use um, wood chips and we get them from a local, saw, um, I guess it's a firewood company that they just have, um, it's almost it's like a thick sawdust like a heavy sawdust it's really nice because it uh, breaks down pretty quickly we just throw that along you know all the litter into a compost bin along with any sort of green stuff that we might have um, and it and we use ofal also we deliver or we um harvest poultry and we also harvest lamb and that ofal right in there uh, really helps heat that material up and break it down uh, we built a composting facility this year, which is really fabulous. Um, it's really important to have those dimensions, I guess, the four by four by four or eight by eight by eight, whatever it is that you're going to do to make sure those things break down in a timely manner. Um, yeah, so the birthing paddocks also, I'd like to encourage folks to make sure that those, the walls in there are small enough so that your babies can't sneak out or we use pallets and sometimes the babies can sneak through one and then they can actually go into the next pallet over, which is always exciting for the next mom when a baby shows up <laughs> in their room. So uh, we like to just put like a, you know, a two by four in there usually stops that. Um, I'm cruising along. Um, also, we light them the, at least the first night if it's winter time, maybe we'll light them for longer than that. Um, they, don't, they don't always wanna be under it and that's when you know that you can definitely turn it off. Um, you want to have water buckets at a height that's not their bottom. The moms, especially if they're getting ready to deliver, you want to have a water bucket that they can't, if you know, if it's, especially if it's a large goat that might stand up or a sheep, um, sheep definitely stand up to deliver. And I've seen them whip them suckers around and uh, they could definitely drop a baby right out of their back end into a water bucket if, uh, if it wasn't protected or safe in some sort of a way. So that's that would never be something fun to find. So um, I think those are kind of my 
oh, and also, you know, if you just have fencing up for your birthing paddock, even if it's in a barn, the babies are really sensitive to the draft and you don't want newborns with pneumonia. So uh, we always just put up um, either cardboard or um, I've even zip tied feed bags to the wall for the first week or two, just to make sure that there's no drafts coming in there um, or plywood. You know, we got a whole bunch of different stuff that we use out in our barn. Any questions on that? I, uh, I'm new at all of this, so I have a couple yeah. questions. Great. Um, I just have two mini alpine goats, um, and I was uh, wondering if they need their own birthing paddocks, or if with just two of them, um, if that's considered uh, safe or uh, I'm wondering what the the idea is for the birthing paddocks for such a small amount. Yeah, so I really encourage folks to have separate birthing paddocks because babies don't know who their mom is and they're going to try and nurse off any teat that they can find. Um, and also moms that haven't delivered yet when a new baby comes up to them that's not theirs, they're not exactly very nice to it. Uh, they can, you know, butt it, whatever. I, I haven't seen anything bad happen, but um, they don't really appreciate some of this trying to suckle on a teeth that's not their baby. Um, moms have this really amazing ability to smell the hiney of their baby, and they can tell which babies are theirs. They can smell their own pheromones in the milk, and they also can tell when that baby has had enough. So you'll see when the mom um, when the baby is nursing, the mom will sniff that butt, even lick the butt. They do eat all the poop and pee that comes out for the first couple of weeks, um, especially that really gross orange stuff, first poops, um, meconium or whatever it's called. I don't know. Um, so I encourage people to keep them separated for, we try to keep them separated for a whole week. Uh, the baby still just, even after a week, they don't really recognize who their mom is. Um, it takes quite a bit of time for them to even recognize their voice, you know, like, so when they actually start going out on pasture or when they're out with other animals, when that mom yells, that baby doesn't always know who their mom is. So we try to keep them enclosed for about a week. Our birthing paddocks are probably, they're, I know they are six by eight and that's where they birth. And then I have a bunch of extra pallets out there that once they've, birthed and had a few days of an enclosed space, um, I will actually put up ex other pallets into the hallway so that it doubles that space so that the mom can walk around and the babies can dance around and stuff. Um, but I do encourage those to be separated. If you have um, like a space that you're using for your goats and you could just take a couple of pallets and corner off a, a corner, um, that would be sufficient also for whoever is birthing. Also, uh, it's good that the impending, the mom that's getting ready to deliver, she wants to have a safe space so she can nest and she's going to take some time and check it out and make sure that there's nothing dangerous in there or, you know, that there's, you know, if there's a cat coming around, she's going to make sure that that cat knows that she's not allowed in her little space. And, you know, she just gets used to it and comfortable. And so that when it comes time to actually deliver, um, that she feels comfortable enough to do that. You want your birthing space to also be big enough for you to get in there with them if, if they needed help. Um, and they do like to back their hiney right up to a wall and they'll start pushing and the bubble will come out. It'll be touching the wall and you'll be like, this isn't going to work for me, girlfriend. You got to grab those legs and pull them off to the side and um, give yourself some space in order to deliver. Um, but yeah, the short answer is I would try as much as you can. Were they bred on the same date? Like, are they due at the same time? Um, they have not been bred. I was going oh. to uh, this fall. Okay. I'm hoping. Yeah. 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 Very exciting. So fun. Babies are the best. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure.
Any other questions regarding birthing that Ronnie could help answer or discussion topics? I'm going to take silence as we're good to move on to the next section. And again, we'll come back if, if you guys think of um, anything as we're going through these topics, um, jot it down or pop it in the chat and we can come back to it at the end. I think Ronnie's frozen. Ronnie, can you hear us? Yeah. Am I here? You're there. Can you see the next okay. slide? Okay, sure. Okay, general animal care. Um, so it's really important whether you have a sheep or a goat that they definitely need free access to free choice, access to loose minerals. Um, I don't encourage the block as their only source of mineral. They do enjoy having blocks. Um, I don't know why it's something that they just really like to do, uh, but the they use the heck out of those free choice minerals, even though our, I feel like we have a really good nutrition program here, but um, they will self-serve whatever it is that they need. Goats and sheep, you want to have separate minerals for them. The goats can eat the sheep mineral, so I usually have a very large um, mineral feeder, not the small black one, but the large ones that are probably like, uh, I guess they're like 10 by no, 10 inches by maybe five inches, and it's usually two of them, and they're called a large mineral feeder over the hook over, something like that. Um, I usually have one of those out and accessible, usually in my sheep paddock, and that has sheep mineral in it and also baking soda. And the goats eat out of that, as do the sheep. Um, in the goat paddock themselves, that's where I keep the goat mineral. Um, we've had some sheep eat the goat mineral. It doesn't hurt them, but it is in a it, the goat mineral has a much higher copper uh, content than the sheep mineral does, and uh, too much copper is not good for a sheep, and the sheep don't know the difference, and they're going to eat it. Sheep do need a certain amount of copper, especially if they are for fiber production. Um, there's also something to be said about sulfur, so if you find that your sheep, maybe their coat isn't as nice, as, well, for goat even also, if you find that their coat isn't exactly what you'd like it to be, um, you know, maybe it's a little coarse or feels, um, or looks frazzly, you might be, you might want to check it out um, and think about copper as an option as well as sulfur. It's also an option for fiber. So if you're into fiber production, I highly recommend researching that um, and finding what kind of things you need. There was a question about um, where do I get my minerals? I get them from the CHS, the Senex. They have a goat mineral, that specific Northwest blend. They also have a sheep mineral. I also get my baking soda from them in what, 50 pound bag or something, 40 pound bag. Um, yeah, and that's just something that I just really check every other day and just see, you just never know how much they're gonna use and I always wanna make sure that that's always accessible to them. Even for the babies, the babies like the minerals too. I would too if all I had to eat was hay and water and like a little snack every now and then. So yeah, I highly recommend those supplements there. Um, Grooming, we don't bathe our animals. Sometimes I feel like I want to bathe them once in a while. You know, they like to roll around in the dirt just like a chicken does, which I always find very interesting, but they do it. And I've always read stuff about, oh, you want to be careful not to flip your ruminants because they could, uh, you know, twist off their stomach and whatever. But these guys flop around like, you know, fish out of water sometimes. Um, but it's really fun to just see them play. Uh, I do shave, uh, you know, before kidding or lambing, you definitely before lambing, you want to crotch then, um, or you're going to have a sticky, crusty mess for a couple of weeks afterwards. And it also makes it easier for the lambs to find the teats, uh, not so much in the goats, but when you go to start milking, you don't want a lot of excess hair in that udder area, and even on the inside of the thighs, because um, anywhere that you're going to touch while you're milking, those uh, that hair can come off and clog up your, your uh, strip cup. Um, so that's about, let's see for grooming. 
Some people cut the beards off their ladies. I don't. I like it. I think it's nice. Um, but definitely the bucks and you want to um, groom them at least once a year. In the summertime, you want to cut that hair off, um, which can be quite challenging. My, he, my shaver just like always overheats when I'm doing uh, the bucks. So I've got one buck running around who's half shaven, but I think he likes it. He's a little punk. So um, yeah. That's it for grooming. They don't seem to overheat very much. The sheep, you definitely want to have shorn at least twice a year, or you might end up with a mess. There's a lot of self, self. Uh, I think it's called roaning. Roaning is different colors, but I think that's also what it's called when a sheep will actually, you can just pull it off. And I think the Icelandics do that, which is a really nice feature. Um, I had a friend, or I have a friend who has the Icelandics and uh, I couldn't believe it one day she was just pulling the fiber off. At first I thought that can't feel comfortable but they seemed to like it and it worked pretty good. Um, there's a local gal out of Bainbridge Island that does our shearing. Um, she is fantastic so I highly recommend that uh, you get a shearer on board um, to do them twice a year. That's, they really don't need it anything more than that. Um, and you don't want to wait too long in the winter, even though sheep have their, their fat is all internal, so it's packed around all their organs. So they can maintain a lot more heat without a coat on than say a goat would. Um, if it's too late in the season, yeah, Elizabeth, that's right. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, I love her. She's like family, I love her. Um, she's actually amazing. She's like a hundred pounds dripping wet and she can just manhandle these 200 pound animals. She's really incredible. Um, okay, what else? Yeah, and if you need to, you can always coat your animals or light them if you need to. Um, one thing that's interesting about sheep versus goats is that sheep don't seem to care if it's raining or if it's snowing. They're still going to go out in it versus goats are made of sugar and they, they honestly think that they will die if they're out in the rain. <laughs> Although I have seen them have some fun out in the rain. Um, but for the most part, they don't really want to be wet. So you always want to make sure that they have access to a shelter or that their paddock is open so that they can go in. Also moms and babies, um, moms can be flighty and they always have to know that they have a place to go. Just, you know, if a ladder falls or something falls, those moms are going to run for the safety of their house. Um, not so much sheep. Sheep might just run and scatter, but uh, a goat with her a dom with her babies is definitely going to run for shelter. So you want to make sure that they always have access to their house. Um, housing, that's pretty much what we just talked about. If you're going to keep your animals outside, I wouldn't recommend that for sheep, for goats, but for sheep, you know, a lean-to building is pretty fine as long as they have significant shelter from the elements, especially if you're going to keep a buck in a, in a um, weather out there, you want to make sure that they have um, a place that also like especially right now it's so hot that you want to make sure that they have a place where they can get shade and um, you want to kind of be aware of where your wind comes from because just like we enjoy a good breeze they do too so using a lot of the metal walls um, you may not want to just do completely metal walls if you want to make sure that they have good airflow during these hot times um, as far as hoop trimming goes, I try to do mine like every three to four months. Um, it doesn't always happen that way. And especially when you have a lot of animals, um, sometimes some of them can miss out on spa day, which is what I call it. I just had one the other day and I trimmed 16 um, different goats hooves and two of them, I don't know how I missed it, but um, luckily I didn't have any sort of roof rot, but they were pretty much ice skating. They were really curled over and uh, gross, but um, we got them trimmed down and that was great. Um, I try to keep a list and then like check them off as they get done. Um, and then also remember that your moms, before you get, before you breed them, uh, it's a good idea to go ahead and do a hoof trim because once they're pregnant, those hooves grow really quickly and you don't really, you know, most goats, that we have anyways, they don't mind having their hooves trimmed. Some of them are in complete panic mode the entire time. So I really try to avoid trimming their hooves while they're pregnant. And it's not something that's gonna 
significantly hurt them unless it's really grown out. Like if you've gone six to eight months without hoof care, you might have a problem. Um, you want to watch and make sure that they're not getting flat footed. That stretches that tendon in the back of their haunch and it can really be uncomfortable and cause long term damage for them. So that's one reason why hoof care is really important. And especially if they're, you know, if they're not on pasture and they're in a zone with that's dirt and it gets to be muddy, that mud will curl up under those hooves and can be, you know, pretty gross and uncomfortable. So you want to make sure that you check your bucks and weathers also to make sure. Um, trimming hooves in sheep is a bit more of a challenge. Those usually get done twice a year and Elizabeth, our shearer, does them. Um, they really need to be butt. You cannot put them in um, like a milk stand like I try to do all my animals in. You can't put a sheep in a milk stand. If you have a squeeze chute, you can try that. Um, but also there's the challenge. They are bigger and stronger than my goats. I have dwarf Nigerian goats, which I can usually hold on to them. And I can actually sit on the milk stand and um, I have a lot of little tricks that I use for those guys, <laughs> including a yoga block. Um, if you trim goat hooves, you've seen these foam yoga blocks that they have. It's perfect for, they're really uncomfortable if you pick up one of their front hooves or, you know, bend one of their front legs. And so I use the yoga block and I put it under that first, under their knuckle or whatever you want to call it on the front leg. And then it's almost, you know, like a, it's a support and they don't seem to mind it. And also I can put pressure on that and hold it there. Um, I always get nervous with the front hooves because those simmer, scissors are, the trimmers are pointed up at their abdomen. And if they kick, boy, I've been sliced by those trimmers, but I haven't stabbed anyone, thank goodness, but it's a real possibility and something that makes me very uncomfortable when I'm trimming a goat that's really skittish. Um, so I got a little, couple little Vulcan death grips that I can do to hold on to them when they're kicking. We use a chair sling to do our sheep hooves. It's still a challenge. I've always wanted to try one of those chair slings and it, you know, at night when you go to bed and you're envisioning how, you know, most people, I don't know what other people think about when they're going to bed, but for me, I'm always. Was I'm just so intrigued by, I would love that because I can't butt the ram. I, Aaron and my husband and I both have tried to do it and we just can't do it. And Elizabeth, even though she's, she is just lean and tall and she can just manage him. And every time Erin and I watch very tentatively, she explains everything. We just can't do it. I don't know what it is. So Odin, I, that's our Ram chairs worth the investment. Okay. I'm definitely, I definitely need to go ahead and look into that. Thank you for that. I'm going to just take a little note. <laughs> Buy the chair sling. Yeah. I usually end up tying uh, Odin up in the the milking parlor and Aaron and I try to distract him from food and I try and lock that hoof under my arm and try and trim it and it's always scary because, I don't know, the trimming, the shears are, are very sharp and they can be very scary and at some point they're cellular so, and he is just a big strong beast. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely going to try that. Some people dremel their animals' hooves. Um, my goat mentor, Jody, she's amazing, and she uh, likes to dremel. In my experience, I've tried that. It doesn't move as quickly as I would like, and also it, may, it, it um, heats up really quickly, and you can tell that they find that uncomfortable. Also, the sound of the machine makes them uncomfortable. Um, which is surprising because it's very similar to the shearing, to the uh, trimmers, the hair trimmers, which doesn't seem to bother them. And when I go to trim a goat, also I'm just gonna have, offer this advice when you go to use the electric trimmers to trim hair, I like to turn it on, let them see it, and then also hold it kind of next to their body so that they can feel that vibration and see that it's not hurting them, that nothing bad is happening to them before I actually go to trim. I also like to, if I'm going to do hooves or whatever it is that I'm going to cut, I like to start at the back of the neck with, their, with my hand and gently bring my hand down the backside of their body, down the rump, to the leg and to the foot and make sure that they know that, you know, I don't like to just go grab right for it. That seems to be 
um, you know, shocking to them, you know, here I am eating and you're just going to grab my foot um, versus I'm going to pet you a little bit. I know that there's people that encourage um, that they get their animals in the milk stand at least once a month for grooming, which I think sounds totally awesome. Um, you know, set them in there, brush them, touch their legs and their hooves, even if you aren't doing anything with them, just to give them that sense of comfort so that when you go ahead to do those things, they're not as shocked and it's not as traumatizing. Um, I always like to actually have music on when I'm in there. Uh, a lot of times I listen to punk rock, except for on the days that I'm trimming hooves. Then I like to listen to something that's a little more comfortable, usually some reggae or something. And it seems to, they seem to like it. Um, but for the most thing, for the most part, I think punk rock is really appropriate with goats because it's chaotic and loud, just like them. So um, anyways, that's my two cents on music and goats. Uh, breeds, I know there's some, uh, everybody's got a little bit of a different things here for their breeds. Um, I just encourage people to make sure that they understand their breeds and that different breeds do have different needs, nutritional needs. Like if you're growing for meat, uh, if you're doing, um, I don't know, are there sheep that you don't, that aren't dual purpose, sheep that are just for fiber? I don't know about that. Um, but definitely in goats, if you're feeding for meat, you needed much different ration, higher protein and whatnot. There's a bunch of different feeders out there um, for meat animals versus um, ones that are for milk um, or probably even that for fiber. I don't know if I've ever seen a fiber blend. Um, but yeah, so it's good to know. It's good to just do research on your breed. Um, you know, and one thing that I encourage folks, if they're just getting into animals and they want to have a certain kind of animal, I encourage you to read up on the temperament of that animal and make sure that it's something that you're interested and willing to deal with. Um, if it's going to be, you know, if you're, if you're planning to have a large herd and just do it for meat or just do it for fiber, um, and you're just going to have them on pasture and you're not going to really interact with them, um, you need to know that that breed is probably, you know, you, you want to choose a brood that's probably more aloof and doesn't really want to be interacted with as much as, say, something like a, a dwarf Nigerian or a fin sheep. Fin sheep, they love people. They want to interact with people, and um, it makes them happy, and, um, and they're fabulous to pet because they're so soft. So um, I really encourage people to do the research on the breeds and make sure that they match. And actually, this goes with all animals. Chickens, also, there are friendly chickens and there are chickens that are not friendly. So I encourage folks to check those things out. Pasturing is something that um, we really think is very, very, very important. Um, the animals need exercise and goats are, um, oh man, what is the word? So goats and sheep kind of have different, um, MOs when they're out on pasture. Uh, sheep are grazers. Oh, what kind of sheep do I have? Um, we have fin sheep and we use them for meat and for fiber. And they're very sweet. They're very nice. The fiber is fabulous. It's got a low micron. It's very similar to merino. Um, if you can get, yeah, I'm just, that's what I'll say. There's a lot of different colors in the fin sheep also. Um, we've got some true black, which apparently is very hard to come by. Uh, we have true black, brown, white, light rose gray, and dark rose gray. So they've got a really nice variety of colors. Um, so sheep are, where did you get them from? Um, we bought our first weather and first you. What do you do with your fiber? Um, we bought them from some friends of ours that were doing fiber. They do yak and they got some fin sheep to put in the mix there. They realized that that probably wasn't their best match, and so we bought them five years ago, and then we got a bummer lamb from a gal who is no longer in Kitsap. She's down in Puyallup. Her name is Emily Zhang. Um, she does the, I want to say she's local color fiber studio, um, she is, she's an amazing fiber artist. Um, she also does Angora rabbits. 
uh, I can definitely get you her information if you're interested. Um, but she's down, I want to say she's in Puyallup area now, which is not impossible. Um, and what do I do with my fiber? I hoard it. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, actually, so since I have so many different colors, um, processing your fiber is really difficult in the sense that you need X amount of pounds in order to send it to a mill. If you want to have a, that color skein, and I don't even know what the poundage is, I, I don't want to say 50 pounds, but let's just say that for example. So each fleece maybe weighs around five pounds once you get it off, if even. So that's 10 shearings, that's five years of shearing for that one color animal. So if you just have one black sheep, you're looking at five years of shearing before you can actually send it in to get a skein of yarn. Um, so that's why I'm, that's why I hoard my fiber. <laughs> uh, I actually do sell fiber. Um, I have it up on our website and people are um, able to come and check it out. Um, and if they, you know, if they want it, I have Jacob sheet and spin a very nice wool as well. I would spin your wool as well. Ooh, wow. That is quite an offer. Um, that sounds really good. Actually, what I'm doing with mine, so, um, you know, all wool has different characteristics. Some lend themselves better, better to making yarn, um, and the different microns tell you what you should make them with, right? Like, you wouldn't want to make socks out of coarse wool. Um, there's just so much that you can do, it, learn about wool. I took a sorting class, sorting and, uh, Ooh, I can't even remember what it was called. I drove down to Yelm. It was really great class and it taught us about fiber, like the science part of fiber. And it was like a three part series. And we didn't know that at that sorting and grading. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, anyways, uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind when you're picking your animals. If you want to use them for fiber arts, you want to know what it is that you want to use them for. Um, thin sheep is actually fantastic for felting. Um, and in fact, if you do not store it correctly, it will felt itself. Um, and so that's what I've been doing with mine. I wash it and dry it in the winter time. That's my winter thing because we have the fireplace going. I set up a table and I let it dry on there by the fire with the fireplace. And then, um, I've been making dryer balls with it, which is really fun. And, and I also felt small, uh, sheep, which is really fun because especially if you have the curly locks and you can felt that in there. It's just so cute. Um, but they take quite a while to make, but it's just something fun to do while you're watching football, which hopefully we get to do this year. Um, let's see if there's any more questions on the fiber or whatever. So pasturing. So it's always good to read information about pasturing and to make a plan of how you're going to do it. The conservation district has a lot of really good resources. You want that grass to be a certain um, height before you let the animals out on it. There's also timings of it. You don't want them to go out while it's in a growing phase because you will stunt it and that grass will be challenged to grow back. Um, the conservation district had, they used to have yardsticks and, excuse me, and they were really cool because it would say on there, you know, it's at six inches feed your animals now or let animals on pasture. Or if it went into the seven or eight um, inches, it would say like um, too tall, you have to mow this or, you know, cause you don't want it to start growing seed heads because then it's going to go into dormancy, right? Like it's not going to grow again. The roots won't tell it to grow after you mow it again, or maybe it will, but it'll go, go short. So uh, we have sacrifice areas on our farm. Um, basically, those are non-fenced off areas. And then we have one, two, three, four, five fenced off, six fenced off areas. We have five acres. Um, and uh, we fence those areas off and we keep the animals out of them uh, during certain periods. Um, and then we also like to get a cutting out of there. We have a um, sickle bar mower. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, sickle bar mower, we borrow a BCS from somebody and we have the part, the attachment that goes on there. And um, we used to use a scythe, the full size, not the hand scythe. And it's really fun and it makes you feel really cool, like you're uh, really homesteading. 
and it makes you very tired and it gives you really great muscles and um and you get a nice you get some nice tan and especially if you have a group of people, like one year we had two interns and we had a roommate that lived here. So there was five of us because you can really only do about 30 to 45 minutes before you're like, I, I need to tap out and you can get quite a bit done. Um, it's a really neat, how many heads do you put on pasture and where do your approximate size of your pasture? Okay. Um, anyways, the, the siphing is really cool. If you, it, no matter what you, how you cut it, whether you use a uh, sickle bar mower or a scythe, you definitely um, need to rake it and you need to flip it at least once or twice a day, depending on the temperatures outside, if you're gonna put up that hay. Uh, sometimes we'll drop the hay and we'll just let the animals in there to eat it or throw it over the fence and just keep them out of the pasture. One thing that's really good and important about having your animals on pasture is that um, completed the nitrogen cycle, you want them to poop and pee out there because they're going to feed the earth. And um, if you are serious about your pasture management, um, reseeding is always a good thing. And, uh, you know, during, at, in the winter time before, well, not winter really, but fall is a good time or early spring when the grass is still growing, you can dig up some areas or rough them up with a rake, a bow rake, and then just drop some seeds. Make sure your chickens don't get out there. Um, there's also some really neat ideas about taking a box that's like one by one and that doesn't have a bottom on it and just set it over your grass area, trim that off, and then you can weigh it. You can send it in for analysis uh, and it'll tell you how much, um, you know, it, you can analyze it to get the protein content and your nutritional content out of it. And I think that's a real, I haven't done it, um, but it's a really fun thing to do. Um, our pasture sizes vary, uh, I'm trying to think. I guess we think that three of them together is one and a half acres. So maybe a half acre per pasture area. Um, and we let animals in there based on the height of it. Uh, there are some times, like especially over the winter when nothing's growing anyways, that will open up different pastures so that um, they have something to do and they have some place to go. Uh, goats and sheep, we, we let ours run together. Um, I feel confident on our wormer treatment that I don't have to worry about crossing um, parasites. Um, that's another thing to keep in mind when you put your animals on pasture is um, the parasites like to, you know, so if you think about the grass is short and then it grows, right? So it's a blade coming up and then there's a blade that's shooting off. That little Y area where that blade shoots off versus the stem um, is a perfect place for you know, water to sit and for parasites to sit. We can't see those eggs. So that's one reason why you don't want to put your animals out on pasture that's too short, especially when it's wet. Another thing to be taken into consideration is frost. If you've got a heavy frost on your pastures, you don't want to let your animals out on those things. Eating anything that's frosted is not good for their rumen. You know how it is to have brain freeze. They can have the same thing in their rumens and it can freeze their rumens. So if you grow things like mangle beets or maybe you want to give them, you know, your kale is spent and you want to throw the whole plant out there for them to eat, you want to make sure that it's not frosted. And um, I, um, they get a lot of their water, daily water intake from the greenery that they eat. So in the springtime, you're gonna see like softer and really green poops. It does not always mean that there's worms, but spring is a great time to worm your animals because this is when the blooming happens. Um, same to be said about coxlidosis in babies is that spring, you're more likely to get a coxy bloom in the springtime or like right now is perfect, right? If you have a baby that's, if you have kids that are about four weeks old, you're in the prime of coxlidosis season. Watch carefully for um, loose stools, uh, swollen abdomens. If you feel that belly and it's really firm, I would go ahead and start treating um, because once coxie comes on, it's, um, it's gross and other babies get poop on them and that's gross and it spreads like wildfire. Um, and uh, what kind of worming treatment do you do? I use Molly's Herbals um, and there's, a bunch of information in here and actually under the parasite section um, there is a link to Molly's Herbal and there's also a article 
that talks about chemical versus herbal wormer. Um, you do have to be pretty dedicated if you're going to do the herbal wormer. It's a weekly thing. Once your animals get used to it, um, they, they knock me down for it. Uh, they like it. It's like candy for them. And I think a lot of that has to do with um, the slippery elm root that I use as a, like a coater on top. They love that stuff. Slippery elm root is also really good for anyone that has diarrhea, um, whether it's a mom or a baby or a buck or anybody that has diarrhea. Um, is this is this molasses and, molasses and garlic? It is not molasses and garlic. It does have molasses. So it's the Molly's herbal, which is a mix of a bunch of different um, herbs, including wormwood. Uh, F1 Formula One has wormwood in it. It is not to be used in pregnant animals. Um, F2 does not have wormwood in it and it is safe for pregnant animals. Um, I can talk a, a lot on this if you want to. There's a lot of information in here. I don't want to bore people that aren't interested in that. I do have a friend, Emily, that um, I talked about a little bit ago. She uses garlic as a wormer in her sheep and she's had really great luck with that. What she does is um, at the end of garlic season, her friends give her all of her imperfect garlic and she juices it and then she freezes it. Um, and then she mixes it with kelp meal and puts it on hay. And that's what she gives her sheep to worm them. Um, and as far as I know, she has great success with that. There's also a product that has, um, that's garlic that also has some silver in it. Um, and somebody gave us a bottle of that. I've used it a few times um, to try to use it as a wormer when I wanted to just try and see what happened. But I also am concerned that silver is a heavy metal and I don't want it to build up in the animals. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of, every, every animal on this planet has got toxins in it. And um, at a certain point, those, the detox pathways can become blocked. Heavy metals are one of those things that's gonna do that blocking. Um, there's a lot of herbal things out there that can unblock those pathways and um, help with the, de you know, help to get rid of toxins. There's like betonite clay and um, other things. The um, bio sponge will actually help absorb toxins, but they'll also constipate your animals. So you don't want to do it unless you've got loose stools for your animals. Um, I'm on a tangent, so I'm going to stop talking. Uh, one more thing I want to say about pasture and about your hay as a whole. Um, one of the most important things about your hay is that it is at least six inches long. Um, you I know in the in the room and you know it seems like it's all compact and all this stuff but that six inch blade sweeping the rumen is what helps stimulate the rumen to continue acting um, to keep it moving so uh, if you have that's why you never want to give your animals grass clippings that you put through your lawnmower don't ever give a ruminant glass grass clippings um, because it will compact them it, and that is uh, I don't know if that's true with chickens because they can grind it up in their gizzard. But I know in ruminants, it's something that's dangerous and can actually com compact their rumen. So make sure you have six inches in your hay and grass. Okay, we haven't done a worming. We've taken a wait and see monitor on the animals. Is regular worming recommended? It is not recommended to just have regular worming. Um, well, that's a tough one. Um, it really depends on what it is, what your principles are on these sorts of things. I'd highly recommend worming prior to breeding, uh, just because you cannot worm during breeding. There's one thing that you can use during breeding. Oh, here's my kitty. Hi, Olive. Um, uh, I highly recommend worming before breeding since we use the herbal wormer. Uh, that seems to work really well. There are some girls of mine that I know get, um, have a tendency to get worm loaded which, um, you know, if you read up on worming and on goat care, you will see that there are just a million opinions of everything. And one of the opinions is that, um, and I don't know, there's a lot of scientific evidence to back it up, so it's not really an opinion, I guess, but that um, 80, what is it, 20% of your herd will carry 80% of your worm load. 
And there are just some animals that are much more susceptible to worms than others. Um, and those animals are always gonna carry a heavier worm load. Now, if you go to a class from, um, from I went to a WSU class up in a small farms thing, way up in like Squim or somewhere up in that area where they had that farm school. And the lady that was teaching that class, she called that uh, worming the, so they classify wormers by color. There's white wormer and blue wormer and whatever. And then there's red wormer, which is a cull. And if you have an animal that's constantly worm loaded that you should just call that animal. Um, I don't do that because um, I can't. I love my babies and I'm just gonna worm them as I need to. And if I need to give them a chemical wormer at that point, I will. You don't want to get to the point where you're having to go to the emergency vet. So I do keep some uh, chemical wormer here. And before I breed for the first time, I've actually just this last fall, I started giving uh, the chemical wormer um, to my ladies before I breed them, especially if they haven't learned to appreciate the herbal wormer. Um, or if it's been a while, if like right now I ordered herbal wormer and because of the COVID, uh, it was two months behind. So I went ahead and gave everybody um, a three-day dose of the herbal wormer. But for those that I'm going to breed, I'm probably going to give them a chemical wormer, just to be sure. If you do do chemical wormer, um, you know, one of the, the second most important time to worm your animals is directly, you know, as soon after delivery as possible. Uh, their immunity is down and the worms can really overload them at that point. Um, and then they can obviously be passed on to your youngsters. So worming at that point is really important. Um, but keep in mind that there will be a withdrawal time. And I haven't been able to get a direct answer as far as, um, you know, a lot of these uh, chemicals will, will be excreted in the milk. And so the babies are going to get a dose of that. And I, I'm not really sure where I stand on if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I just like to think that I don't want to do anything to compromise a baby's rumen um, biology at that point. Uh, chemical wormer. It's different between the sheep and the goats. Um, in the um, parasite section, um, there's a really great chart. There's actually two really great charts. Um, that are in there, when to use and what to use. And it's actually got veterinarian dosing. One thing that you'll find when you, as you move along the world of veterinary medicine in ruminants is that um, there's not a lot of medicine out there that has been approved for use in ruminants. It's always about cows. What's the other animal that it's used for? Oh, I, well, that's not what I mean, Erin. My, my husband just reminded me that cows are also ruminants. Um, you know, it's really based on large-scale agriculture. So finding goat dosing and sheep dosing is sometimes different, difficult. Uh, we use um, Balzaban and also, uh, let me just take a look here. Yeah. So we use Normectin Plus. Um, it's got, it's ivermectin with some uh, chlorsulum. It's, it's quite expensive, but um, it actually treats, I want to say it also treats lungworm, which isn't always something that we have to worry about here unless you have snails at your house. Yeah, it treats lung, lungworm and adult liver flukes. Um, one thing that is highly recommended is that you do fecal testing on your animals at least once a year to kind of see what you're dealing with on your property. And I've listed a lot of different places that you can send your, um, your samples to. Um, if it's a good place, they might have recommendations of what you should use. There's also so much immunity that has been um, built up over overuse. So that's one reason that you don't want to just like worm your whole herd at one time because um, it creates into or what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, not immunity, but the worms can change tolerance. The worms 
can decide that they're not that's not going to be useful for them anymore. We also use a uh, vel velbazen. Um, it's a broad spectrum dewormer and it can be used for both um, sheep and goats. And it's actually the one thing that's got, um, oh yeah, it only works for liver flukes in goats. So, and unfortunately, I don't believe liver flukes come out on a fecal sample, but you'll have the signs of that when they're, you know, they'll have respiratory symptoms, coughing and whatnot. Um, the Normectin Plus is an injectable, but it's also something that you can give orally. And that is how I give it. If you've never given a ruminant a shot before, um, you know, there's, I've got some information in here. Use caution. They, they don't appreciate pain. And um, I have had goats seem like they were having a seizure after I gave them a shot. Uh, CDT doesn't seem to do, so it doesn't seem to have a problem unless, you know, they have an anaphylactic shock, which in that case, I really hope you have epi around. Um, because recently one of my friends actually she had to use epi on one of her babies when she gave it the cdt but that's not uh, a common thing that's pretty rare and so if you raise a lot of animals at some point that probably is going to come up for you but giving them a shot in their muscle um they don't react well to that um some of them do okay with the um like the b vitamin if you gave them a b complex booster uh BOCI, a lot of people use that pre-breeding. It's got um, the, the B vitamins in it, plus it also has selenium in it. Uh, I want to say maybe something else in their boron or something. Um, that tends to be uncomfortable for them. Um, so be well prepared. If you're going to give an animal a shot, don't do it alone. Ah, yeah. Okay. I feel like I maybe I missed one question there. What kind of I think that do you use? asked what do you feed in the winter i think that's the one that we skipped what do we over feed in the winter um we use orchard grass that we just buy from our local guy we always use orchard grass we don't mess around with um alfalfa because they tend to just waste it um they'll they don't actually really like it it's, it's too much sticks they can't get it through the feeder trough um so we like to do orchard grass and that's about it. Uh, unless they're in milk or pregnant or uh, sheep, we feed afterwards until the body conditioning score gets back up to um, a respectable level. If they've got two or three babies, it might take a lot longer, especially in a sheep, to get them back up to their body conditioning score. Because those babies will drink milk for a whole year unless you separate them. Even longer, probably. All babies will, for that matter. Unless you, did you want to know specifics like what, what, what specifically we use? I'm not sure if Kirsten wanted that. Um, she can jump in if she wants to yeah. talk more about that. Um, okay, animal health. This one's always fun. Uh, we've actually talked quite a bit about some of this stuff. Um, I've already talked about how important it is to know your vet in your area, know who there is. Um, we're really lucky that we have Clover Valley here um, and that they offer um, to come to your house, mobile vet. A lot of times it's really difficult to get an animal in the vehicle. And we used to drive to Squim to see Dr. Swan and that's a long drive when you have an animal that's having a problem. Um, and it's a long time to wait for somebody to come to you also. So um, we're really lucky. We also have um, Dr. Jasmine, can't remember her last name right now. Uh, it's in my phone, which I'm on. Um, so we do have some good vets here. Um, uh, I discourage folks from going on to the Facebook goat emergency and whatnot and asking for help on there. Uh, it can take a while for those vets to get back to you. They always have more questions and it seems like a real waste of a time if it's not an emergent situation and you want to do that. But also remember, just like me, I'm not a veterinarian. I just have opinions because I've been doing this for a while. Um, but you're going to get a lot of opinions. And honestly, I, I look at that page sometimes and I'm just like, oh, good Lord, what are these people telling people, you know? So take that information with a real grain of salt. If you choose to go that right, I highly encourage you to 
find your answers elsewhere than on there. Or, you know, if you're going to use the Facebook sites, um, do the one where it's just the veterinarians answer you back and hope for the best. Always take your temperature of your animal because that's the first thing they're going to ask. As much facts and as much details as possible is always helpful. Um, and a timeline. If you notice, you know, maybe she was off a couple days ago and you thought maybe it was just something that she needed to clear out and she was still eating and pooping at that time, but today she's lethargic and whatever, keep that timeline and that's all really important. And um, don't wait until uh, it's not getting up. If it's lethargic and not feeling well, check your temp and get help right away. Um, I, I always like the B12. It seems to be helpful for pretty much any situation. I also have some aloe vera juice and cod liver oil as like medians. A cod liver oil has lots of good stuff in it. Um, not to be confused with mineral oil. Mineral oil is something that you only want to use in case of an emergency internally because it does coat the villa and the absorption of the stomach, which is one reason why you want to use it if you have a toxin in your animal. Uh, the mineral oil will. Uh, decrease the amount of absorption that that has. Um, but if you, but in order to deliver mineral oil, like through a drench or something, you need uh, some sort of a solution to put it in. And cod liver oil seems to be really good, especially if you get the lemon flavored stuff. My animals just eat it. I, I don't even know how many times I, I'll, I'll bring the dish out there and I'll also bring my drencher in case I have to suck it up and give it to them. Uh, force them to have it, but for the most part, they just eat it. So make sure you have a container that will fit their face so that they can actually lick it up. Um, also, you know, okay. For what was that good? The cod liver oil? Cod liver oil? Never heard of it? Is this what you were saying? Yeah, cod liver oil. Yeah, from the cod fish. Yes. And for what do you use it? Uh, well, it is an, well, I use it uh, a couple of different things. Like, I do a lot of like pre-delivery things, immunity boosting when they're getting ready to have a baby. And I will use cod liver oil because it's got vitamin E in it and a lot of other things in it. Um, and then I'll put some other things in there. Like I'll put some cayenne pepper in there and I'll put some um, D vitamin and some C, some vitamin C in there. And I make a little slurry and I give it to them so that they have you know, just a little extra boost before delivery, maybe the day before. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, if your animal isn't feeling well and you need to give them a little boost of something, like especially a sheep, if a sheep is stressed, like let's say your ram got out and chased your females around and they are dog in it. They are exhausted. They're laying down, they're panting They are They have spent all their B vitamins because that's what happens when you're stressed out. You, us too, we spend, we burn through our B vitamins. Um, so I like to give them, I'll take one or two capsules. I've given them whole capsules. They chew them. I bet it's totally disgusting, but they, they do it. I think it's better to give them in a drench form or um, if they're stressed out, they're not going to take it out of that container. If you make them a yummy slurry, they aren't going to drink it. Um, and you would want to drench the animal at that point. Uh, but if, you know, if your animal isn't feeling well, intervene, do something, check the poop. Even if you have to dig it out of their butt, I would you know, do a little, what they call the trauma surgeon handshake and check out their poop and see <laughs> what it's like. If it's wet and sloppy, I would do some sort of a bio sponge, uh, slippery elm root. I'll actually mix like things like slippery elm root. I'll mix that with milk, like the goat milk that we actually have. It's got probiotics in it. It's got, not only does it have the probiotics, but it also has the fibers that the probiotics need to survive and to live happily in the rumen or in anyone's intestine, which is why raw milk is great. Um, I'll mix those things together and I'll drench them with that also. So there's a lot of different things that you can do. Um, but if you win and if you make, uh, I hope that you will make a relationship with the vet and um, things that I encourage you to get while you have a relationship with the vet is to buy a bag of bio sponge. You can buy it online also, or you can get it from your vet. I got a two pound bag, I think for like $10. I think that was a screaming great deal. 
They also have it in the tube, like the selenium vitamin E gel comes in a tube, which is really great. I just keep it on the shelf in the barn. It's shelf stable. I don't have to mix anything up. Uh, the other day, you know, the animals are on pasture right now. And so <clears throat> it's not uncommon to see loose stools. And one of my gals, she didn't want to eat. Um, and I looked at her butt and she had some runny poop. So I gave her 10 cc's of bio sponge. And the next morning she was happily eating and feeling better and having solid poops. So the bio sponge is a clay and uh, similar to like, uh, I won't even go there. I'm not going to go there. Um, but it's a clay that will absorb toxins and bacteria and viruses. It's really amazing. Humans can take it too. I took a dose um, and I got constipated. So just keep that in mind. It will dry you up because it is a clay. So know that before you go there. You don't want to give it unless there's diarrhea but it is a great thing. You can order it online. They have a website. I think it's called Platinum Bio Sponge and uh, you can order it for humans also. Mm -hmm. uh, parasites, uh, we got a whole section in the book. Go ahead and read up on that. Just remember there's internal and external parasites. Please don't use straw for bedding. Um, a lot of different critters can live in that. I get a lot of phone calls about you know, my animals have bald spots or they have scales on their legs or they keep tapping their foot on the ground and biting their own, you know, fur. And a lot of that is, you know, parasites. Also, when you have your animals on the milk stand, you want to make sure that you're, you know, that's an opportunity to check them. At least once a week, go ahead and run your hands up and down their, their legs and on their chest, you know, places where the animals are laying on the litter and, and make sure that you don't have any issues. Watch for balding spots. Um, especially around um, like the show. Well, I'm trying to think. It's been a while since I've had a bald spot on my animals. But my boy Feely, he used to get them on his, uh, like his chest area. And, but since he lives out with the boys and I don't have a lot of interaction with him, I noticed that he was balding one day. And so I checked it out. And sure enough, he had all this little fuzzy little fluff. So I grabbed some diatomaceous earth and I rubbed it into that spot and I rubbed it into his armpits. I rubbed it along his spinal column or the spinal line and in his, um, his neck and uh, around the ears area and he was fine. Um, diatomaceous earth works amazing for external parasites. Um, we like to do it after we shear the sheep, give them a little lousing, um, whether or not they have any problems there. It's just kind of a good thing to do. Um, and if you're lucky, your cat may even roll around in the diatomaceous earth that's left on the ground and delouse herself, which ours did and I thought was fabulous because when I've tried to do it to her before, she's an indoor-outdoor, she doesn't care about fleas, and she's real healthy because she eats a lot of raw food that she catches on her own, so I'm pretty sure she's completely full of worms, but she's happy and content, so, but if she can delouse herself, I think that's fabulous. Um, there's also a couple of other products um, the I have listed in the resource guide, the Crystal Creek Lice and Mange Enzymatic Wash. So most parasites have, a, I want to say a carapace. I don't know if that's exactly the right term for it, but they have a hard outer shell and they are protected. And it's really hard to get under that shell. And that's what you have to do if you're going to kill that thing. They do have joints in them though. Like if you think of a beetle, Okay, that would be a good example of what these things look like if they were blown up. So they've got crevices where their body's attached, like where the head meets the thorax, so that they can have motion, right? And those are the places that you hope to get in with, um, with your whatever it is that you're trying to kill that animal. Um, you know, some people just go straight for the bloodline, and since these parasites, obviously, that's what they're for, is they want to suck that animal's blood so that they can breed. Um, <clears throat> you can go the way of poisoning them via through the animal's blood. Some people do the porons, other people give an injection. Um, I personally like to just use a topical, something that does not um, affect my animal itself. Um, but the enzymatic wash, I got that um, a while ago and uh, it was expensive, but it it is amazing. Um, I also like to one year after a really bad winter, um, when the springtime came, 
I just kept forgetting to get Elizabeth on the schedule to shear. And when we finally shore the animals, the hair was a mess and I pretty much threw most of it away. Um, and they all had lice. And I used this spray. I just sprayed it on them and I scrubbed it in with a scrub brush. And then, and then I rinsed them off. And the next day they were totally, you, you couldn't find anything on them. So it's an enzymatic, and so it actually foams into those little broken areas of them and uh, and destroys them. So, um, but you always, you know, after you louse or after you um, do an enzymatic wash or anything, any sort of a treatment, you want to make sure that they have fresh litter. And as long as you have fresh litter, it really shouldn't be a problem because those bugs don't have a place to harbor. So you also want to think about how much wood you have around, which most of us have wood barns, and like we use wood chips. Um, certain things like mites really like wood and that's why people that have wooden nesting boxes typically have more mites in their chickens than maybe someone that uses metal might have. Um, so first aid, there's a whole lot of things about first aid. One thing that I highly recommend is that you always have cayenne pepper around um, and black pepper. Um, I have a box in my, um, a container of black pepper in my hoof trimming kit. So, um, and so like the other day when I was cutting hooves and some of them were really overgrown, I had two girls that I bled. Um, so I don't let them put their foot down. I keep paper towels out there also. I'll take a paper towel, fold it into fours, wet it a little with, I use a spray, um, spray alcohol bottle. I spray that little paper. I pour some, a good amount of that uh, black pepper on there. And then while the hoop is still in the air and it's bleeding, I'll spray it with alcohol, even though that thins the blood. Um, but it will also clean that area. And then I put the foot down on that paper towel and I quickly pick up another leg so that they don't dance around and try to move that leg. Um, and then their own pressure will stop that. But also what I learned from Elizabeth the shearer is that one day, uh, Aaron and I were trimming hooves before Elizabeth was cutting, which didn't work out because she's just super ultra fast. And we cut one and we're doing all this stuff. We got the animal on its side. We're trying to put pressure and we're trying to cobay on it and all this stuff. And Elizabeth's like, why don't you just let it get up and run around? It's got 120 pounds and it's going to make, that's going to stop bleeding just by that animal running around. And she was right. And so I learned something that day also. Um, there there are a lot of different scenarios that can happen as far as first aid goes. Um, what I see a lot of on the emergency vet sites is my goat or my animal was attacked by a dog. And that is always a total nightmare. Uh, luckily, it hasn't happened to me, but I feel horrible when I see people have saying that this happened because what a, what a horrible event for the animal, right? It's completely traumatizing for them. Um, of course, these animals being sentient beings, um, they do have a significant shock reflex that can cause them to die much sooner than their injuries will. Um, so again, the B12 is very important for them. If you've got CBD oil to help them relax, I always recommend that. There's different strengths, so use caution. The good thing is it's not a narcotic, so it does not drive down their respiratory drive. Um, and it's just comforting, um, uh, relaxing for them. There's always, you know, so their stress and their, you know, the stability, and then there's infection. So you've got a couple of things going on with any first aid situation. The first thing is you just want to make them feel comfortable um, or safe in that moment. You want them to feel safe, even though they're not going to really feel totally safe, but to know that that danger is gone, that that dog cannot come back, um, that you are there is huge for them. Um, you want to obviously apply pressure to any wounds. I really recommend making a significant first aid kit to have out in your area where your animals are. Include the cayenne pepper, include a drencher, include, um, you know, you can always run to the house and get like things that like we don't leave a lot of that stuff out in the barn because it's not weather proof so like I wouldn't leave cod liver oil out there that stuff's expensive and I don't want it to freeze um but you know like gauze and coban or some sort of a wrapping material so that you can actually apply pressure um peroxide is good for a first washing of anything unless it is a puncture wound do not put peroxide into a puncture wound 
you want to flush that with the cleanest water that you can um, to start with. Syringes are always good, both kinds, Lurlock and Slip Tip. Um, slip Tips are great for flushing wounds. I've been a wound, I was a wound nurse for a couple of years and um, that was just always very helpful. If you have access to like IVs and um, so when you put in an IV, um, there's a cannula over the needle and that cannula has a Lurlock on it. And so if you have access to that and you take that needle out and you just use the plastic cannula, you've got a good half inch to a whole inch that you can screw onto a syringe and really flush something with. And those are fabulous. You can keep that, you know, soak it in alcohol before you use it or whatever it is that you want to do to sterilize it. But once you have one of those, hold on to that baby and protect it. Make sure that it's cleaned off after you were. It's uh, made of silicone, medical grade silicone, so it can be uh, cleaned. You want to make sure there's no debris in it, so you might want to keep the needle so that you can poke through there and clean it afterward. Um, and then saline syringes are always something that uh, we use a lot of when we have an emergency. Not only can you use them to flush wounds um, or for quick, um, you know, oral nutrition, um, just to give them some salt, but you can also do something called a backpack, which is again, if you you would need to have access to a cannula or something, I use I like the butterfly ones. Um, you can give them a backpack. I mean, if you don't know about that, um, if you have access to those items, uh, it's something good to look into because if your animal's dehydrated and cannot take anything orally, you can do something called a backpack, which is infusing a small amount of liquid. Um, in between the shoulder blades and the subcutaneous area, and that will absorb into the animal. So if you bring your dog or your cat into the vet and they are nauseated, um, which in a dog and a cat, one thing that you'll see is this eyelid that comes up and covers half the eye. Um, it's a, I don't even know what it's called, but it's not the external eyelid, it's a different eyelid, and that will show that they are nauseated and dehydrated. And uh, they will give a fluid backpack. Sometimes it's 250 ml, sometimes it's 500 ml, depending on the size of your animal. But um, I just have a bunch of saline syringes. And like when my cat was nauseated not that long ago, maybe a, six months ago or so, I gave her this big fluid backpack and um, that was it. She was good to go after that. She just felt like not eating or drinking for a while, but that got her through. I've done that with goats, definitely. Um, we had a little buckling that got goat polio or um, what is it called? Listeria. Oh, I can't remember what the other word for it is. It's when um, it's overeating syndrome when a animal gets into the feed, especially the grain. Um, they will over ruminate that, which is one reason why it's very good to have a CDT on shot or um, CDT shot on board. One of the components of that is the Clostridium perfringes, um, which is what is fermenting the grain. And so having that CDT shot will help to prevent that. If you do get overeating, you'll see some things like stargazing where the animal's looking over its shoulder and like rolling over. Um, you're at a really detrimental point. At that point, call a vet, start an IV if you can. And I've, I've done just a backpack for that. Um, that little guy, uh, but they need injections. They need the antitoxin, the clostridium antitoxin, and also um, thiamine injections and an antibiotic at that point. So you definitely want a vet on board for that. Um, but you can rehydrate an animal. Don't ever use water. Don't inject water. You, it has to be saline um, and it should be sterile. So um, anyways, I've gone on far too long about that. Um, understand the FAMACHA score and how to use it. There's a lot of um, information online. Uh, in the when to call the veterinarian section, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. Again, we talked about the temp, any symptoms, timelines important, uh, were they on pasture, um, is there any cough or discharge from the eyes or the nose, that's always something important. And also know that um, your litter, um, squat down in your litter, and if it smells strong to you, it's gonna smell strong to them. And that can cause respiratory issues for them. Um, it can cause crusty eyes and um, snotty nose. Um, 
and can it, and then it can actually cause respiratory illness like um, pneumonia and stuff. So you want to make sure that your litter is clean. If it smells bad, get it out of there. Even if you don't have anything else to put in there. I mean, if you can just throw a little bit of wasted hay on the ground, it's better than wet wet litter. Uh, you don't want ammonia. Um, oh, another thing that's really important about how is my goat doing? Is it feel good? Is that um, do are they chewing a cud? An animal that does not feel good will not cough up a cud. And if they are sitting there, if they're sitting, they should be chewing a cud. If they're not eating, if they're um, in their little, um, oh, what is it called? Uh, when they're ruminating, it's called something. When they're just hanging out ruminating and chewing their cud. I can't remember right now. But anyways, they should always be chewing a cud. Um, and then there's in here also includes the normal vital signs for ruminants. So make sure that you know those things also. Um, Clover Valley, network with people. Oh, activated charcoal is another good thing. However, now that I know about this bio sponge, um, the bio sponge is really great. There's a list of other things that you can use here. Um, I've just started using this aloe vera juice because it's a GI soother just like the, um, the slippery elm root is a GI soother as well. Um, yeah, so I've talked a whole lot. Is there any questions? I have some questions. Yeah. Can you please say the vet name again? Because I didn't understand it, the vet which you like. And this yeah. is which area? Where are you living? Is this Kitsap or Bainbridge? Yeah, or this is... It's Kitsap, and it's actually, this doctor is located in Port Orchard. I'm going to go ahead and pull out a card here, I mm -hmm. think. It's called Clover Valley Veterinary Services, uh -huh. and the phone number is 360-917-5887. Okay. And they have a lot of really great vets. There's another gal named Jasmine Feist, F-E-I-S-T, F-E-I-S-T. I have her number in my phone here. Um, I wonder if I can look at it while I'm on no, here. With that's you okay. That's okay. One okay. Plenty. And yeah. um, for the shot giving, I just um, did as a, for the first time I had cheap and I gave them this DDT shot after two months. Can you reuse the syringes again for the booster shot? Or do you need to have new ones? Because I watched some YouTubes and they gave, you know, a hundred cheap the same shot with one syringe with a backpack vessel of the stuff in it. So it looked like they used the same needle all the time. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend that just because the skin is dirty and I'm also an RN and I would never uh, use a needle twice. I okay. do use the same syringe, but I will swap out the needle. I also don't want a dirty needle going into my bottle, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I definitely swap out the needle in between injections. Plus every time that you use that needle, it's got a little bit of a silicone lubricant on it, which helps to penetrate the skin. Um, yeah. And that, that wears down also. So um, I would not use a needle multiple times. However, I will reuse the syringe that day. Like, you know, if I'm going to inject 16 sheep or goats, I will use that same syringe, but I will not reuse the needle. Also, when you use a needle, you'll notice that there's a pointy end and then there's a short end. So there's a bevel, right? Mm -hmm. You notice that on the, on the needle? I will have to look again. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you look at the part that's actually going to go in there, it's called a bevel. You've got a sharp point and then you've got a sharp, a short part. You yeah. always want to make sure that whether you're putting it in the bottle, which you always want to alcohol swab every time you put a needle into a bottle, because you can contaminate that medication and then that medicine will, that'll, that can grow in there or fester in there. And then you're using contaminated medicines. So you don't want to do that, especially with your CDTs. Um, uh, you want to make sure that that pointy part is always going in first, whether it's the animal or into the bottle, because you can poke a hole in either one of those things and um, you can actually um, make it not sterile anymore, your bottle, by poking that hole in there. 
Also, it makes it much more comfortable and much easier to go into your animal. And sure. when you when you give a shot to an animal, and it always makes it tricky because um, you should, once you've got the needle under the skin, you should always pull back on that plunger just a little to make sure that you're not in a vessel. You know, it might just be awkward luck that one day you hit a vessel and you, you know, you pull some blood into your, into your syringe and you're like, oh my gosh, do not give that shot. You want to pull out and retry because you do not want to give a CD shot or any shot for that matter into the vein unless that's actually what you're trying to do. And then in that case, you would not be giving that injection right behind the front leg. So, yeah. Um, okay. yeah. And could you tell me this book name which you're um, talking about because I wasn't there in the very beginning of the meeting, so I guess I missed it. Oh, so did you receive the email invitation to this class? Yes. So in there, um, attached to that is a resource guide. Okay, okay. Yep. All right. Good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. What else do you guys want to talk about? I guess I'm at the end of what I need to talk about. Oh, I guess we have one more slide. So this we threw in there because we were going to be talking about um, agritourism as part of this. And now with COVID happening, obviously, there's not a lot of on-farm tourism stuff happening or capable of happening. Um, but I, I really wanted to um, have just a space in here for people who are interested in hearing Ronnie and Aaron's story about how they kind of went from um, raising their animals and then kind of delving into this new uh, goat yoga. Um, I, I know that there's probably other people on the call that might be interested in, in agritourism in general. So we kind of filtered in some things in here. We don't have to talk about them, um, but, I, but we wanted to leave that space open in case you guys did have specific questions about that. So maybe we could start with uh, Ronnie, you giving a brief overview of kind of what you guys have been doing with that. Yeah. Uh, so Erin and I, have, um, one of our missions as far as um, being part of the agricultural community in this uh, land, in this, um, yes, mm -hmm. it should be in your phone. Um, sorry about that. Um, one of our missions is that we want, uh, our big mission is to save agricultural land. We want people to preserve land. And so because of that, the best way to preserve land is to utilize farmland, right? So if a farmer buys the land or just somebody that wants to keep animals, it's better than paving over it because you can't fix that. You can see that by the Kitsap Mall, which used to be the most fertile land in Kitsap County. It's now under a mall, which no one shops at anymore. Anyways, um, so for us, we feel that people have become so dissociated from their food and from animals. And, you know, humans have lived with animals for over how many years, Aaron? 10,000 years? How many years? Five to six thousand. <laughs> okay, five to six thousand years we've lived with animals, and um, just only the last over the last like hundred years we've really disassociated ourselves and been like I'm too good to like live with animals. But it's something that is still very important and um, in an obvious and natural connection that people have when they are with animals. You're just gonna have to wait for me to be done. Um, and so what we have found is that by offering farm tours and time to interact with animals, people find that love again. And um, it's different than going for a hike in the woods or going for a row in your kayak, um, connecting with animals and seeing agriculture in um, happening is um, really profound and it's very soothing to people's souls and uh, we we've definitely found that and uh, even though it's a lot of work for us we are still grateful for it every single time we walk out that door and see what we've got outside that um we're very lucky i might cry jess is gonna laugh okay anyways um so uh we offer farm tours we try to do some community events here obviously where we're gonna do this today and share our animals with you and our farm um and so that's really where it came about um, that we wanted to share this with other people. A lot of farms in Kidsett County don't want people on their land. There's a lot of liability 
Um, obviously there's a lot of dangers on a farm. There's, you know, there can be electric fences. There can be holes that your dog dug because he thought there was a mole there and maybe you didn't see that hole and then somebody falls down and gets hurt. And next thing you know, you're living in an apartment downtown Bremerton because Someone sued you for your farm. So nobody wants that kind of liability. So a lot of people don't allow people to be on their farms. Um, we have insurance through county, through Country Financial. And in order to get insurance through Country Financial, um, which is right there, you have to be a member of the um, Farm, Bureau. Farm Bureau. Thanks, Aaron. Um, which is like, Ooh, $160 a year on top. And that's just to have access to Country Financial, but they are the only people that we can find that'll actually insure a farm. Um, so we actually have our house insured through them and the farm. Um, they do buildings and whatnot. Um, they seem to be quite reasonable people and uh, we've enjoyed them. Um, yeah, what else do you want me to talk about? What it's like to have people on the farm um, creating an agritourism business is, uh, it's a lot of work. For one, you have to get people to notice that it's happening. Um, we do a lot of guerrilla marketing, which is just using Facebook. Um, having a website is helpful because people like to Google stuff. And, um, you know, they can Google kits at farming and find all kinds of stuff. Some lady showed up at our house the other day because she Googled Kitsap sheep and we showed up. So it was a religious holiday called Shepherd's Day and they wanted to uh, celebrate Shepherd's Day by actually seeing sheep. And so they came to our farm and even though they were unannounced, I could see how excited they were about the sheep and they just wanted to see them. And so we went out into the field and it was really great. I had a lot of fun. I can't help it. I just love them, the animals so much that I love when people love them and appreciate them. So, um, do you charge uh, for people visiting your farm and also for Jess? Uh, if you do, you know, goat yoga, how do you do this uh, money wise? Do you charge for that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we charge for farm tours. We do a, a hour tour for five people for $20. And if you add any, anyone extra is another $5. Um, and it lasts about an hour. Um, we just kind of take them around and introduce them to all the animals and show them about our permaculture and the fields and the barn and that kind of stuff. People seem to be really receptive to pretty much anything agriculture at this point. They just uh, want to see it and be a part of it, you know. It's just a calming thing to be a part of. Um, the goat yoga piece, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes with that. We have a second rider um, that's different than our normal insurance with Country Financial. We have a separate policy for the goat yoga. Um, there's a lot of things that you need to know about. Um, you know, you have to think about stuff like parking and um, a porta potty, and folks have to be able to wash their hands afterwards. Um, and safety and you know all the things you want to make sure everybody has a good time during goat yoga so Aaron and I end up being in there facilitating you need a um you need an educated instructor we actually have a real yoga teacher to teach our classes um which can be challenging because uh you know there are some yoga people that are like this is sacrilegious well no it's not uh that's you know <laughs> that's okay if that's their opinion but um it's not the opinion of everybody so um, you know, and then there's marketing and, um, it, all of it is, is tricky and we charge $25 a person classes. Our sessions are 45 minutes, but we tell people to give themselves an hour and a half. Um, because after the yoga piece is over, we want them to interact with the, with the goats and, um, mm -hmm. take selfies. And then Aaron offers a farm tour, uh, so that they can, um, you know, just round out their whole experience. And it's really good. It's, um, people really enjoy coming to a farm. Even the guys that their wife or their girlfriend makes them come, they always have a good time in the end. And, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just a good thing to just see people connecting with the, with the agriculture and animals. I don't like when people try to pick up my chickens though. Don't <laughs> pick up my chickens. 
but because yeah. of COVID, you're not doing it right now, right? Or Correct. Yeah. Yep. Which was def devastating because we had uh, 17 babies born between the uh, first week of March and the uh, first week of April. So we've got a ton of babies and no one to play with them. So uh, we've decided that we're going to go ahead and start selling those babies now, um, which is, you know, kind of heartbreaking, but it is what it is. And we'll just hope for something better here soon. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it looks like there's a question from Tara in the chat about how did you uh, learn what you needed to know about the legal aspects of agritourism? And can I schedule a farm tour for just me and ask a lot of questions <laughs> after COVID, of course. So if you could answer that, that would be amazing because I think other people are probably going to be interested in, in knowing how accessible you are after this for questions as well. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so as far as accessibility, you can always email me. Um, you can email, ooh, can I have them use the Smithshire, Erin? Sure. Okay, you can email me at the Smithshire at Gmail, or the Smithshire, yeah, the Smithshire at gmail.com. If you wanna just put my name in the subject, um, that would help my husband <laughs> out. We're trying to figure out how we can just get our own emails, Ronnie at the Smithshire. Okay, we just need to do that. We're gonna do that eventually. My husband's in the other room listening to every word I say and monitoring me, so. <laughs> uh, yes, um, you can come to the farm now. Um, you know, we can schedule a visit um, for you to come and just check stuff out. I'm totally fine with that during the COVID thing here. Um, you know, the certain times of the day would be better than others. So go ahead and email me and we can set up a time for that, that works fine. Um, learning the legal aspects of this, um, there, you know, obviously you need to have insurance, you need to have liability coverage. Um, the egg code doesn't say a whole lot about it, uh, but it's good to kind of look through the egg code and just kind of be prepared with things. Obviously, can we go back to the last slide? There's something very important in this slide that I wanna make sure that you are all aware. If you are planning to have animals, please do not be that person that oversteps your land capabilities and causes the government to add more rules. Um, I like rules. I like to follow rules, but does anyone on your farm work share animal care time away from the farm? Oh, I wish that we could get away from the farm. Um, anywho, get a farm plan, which is listed above, Kitsap, uh, conservation district.org. If you plan on having animals, get a farm plan and just get it started right now. Um, you don't have to wait for it to be done in order to get animals, but think about your, if you could do everything you wanted to do on your farm, that's realistic, include all of that in your farm plan. Your goals, how you plan and manage those things, you've got to be able to manage your manure, you've got to be able to manage your pastures. You cannot let your animals just be on dirt. Um, that's not healthy for them. And it's not something that the community is gonna appreciate, um, especially if you have neighbors and you don't have a way to compost your, your manure, you're gonna cause problems. And um, if you cause problems and you raise flags, those flags are not gonna just be for you, but they're gonna be for all farmers. And uh, a lot of work just went into the recent egg code update and at this point they are not restricting us on our animals but what you have to do is be a sensible and responsible owner and you have to manage all parts of your animals um, their safety they've got to have good you've got to have fences um, you know I mean you can't be responsible for some other somebody else's dog coming onto your property and jumping your fence and hurting your animals. But if you don't have a fence and that dog comes over and hurts your animals, you're going to have a lot harder time, um, you know, with that situation than you would if you had um, things in, in place. We all get excited. We all want to have our animals. Do not jump the gun and just get animals and think that you're going to build a world around them. You really need to um, create your you know, it doesn't have to be amazing. It doesn't have to be your final thing, but it should be something that is safe and will keep them 
safe and healthy until you can get whatever it is that you need to get done. Um, make sure you're prepared and that you've thought this out. Make sure that you financially can afford to feed these animals. Hay is $25 a bale. And um, for, let's see, right now I've got seven ladies in milk and 17 babies. And they go out on pasture all day and they live in the barn. And I have six hay feeders in there. And we probably go through, Aaron, we go through at least one bale a week in there, maybe one and a half. So that's about $30 of hay. Um, as far as feed goes for ladies in milk, um, we go through two bags of feed, goat feed, which is $25 a piece. We go through half a bag of sunflower, black oil sunflower seeds, that's $50 for a whole bag, so $25 of that. And then we go through a bag of pellets, which is $25. Um, and that's a week. Eh, maybe it's half a bag of pellets. Um, so you want to do the math and make sure that you can actually handle what it is that you have. You don't want to get in that situation where you are not, you know, where your animals don't look good. Uh, and where they aren't good, where they're not healthy. Um, I see it all the time on Facebook. I see sickly looking animals and it just kills me. It's like, oh my gosh, please, you know, because um, you don't want to be reported and you don't want to be a bad person. And uh, like I said, these are sentient beings and we are responsible for every facet of their, health, of their health and their happiness. They can't do it on their own. So we, they need us to take care of them. So please, think through all of these things before you decide to get a cute baby goat um, because they do get big and they become a responsibility and also um, only get a buck or only make a buck, which means don't band it. If you are ready to commit to that animal's life for its life, I mean, yes, you can sell bucks, um, but make sure that you are ready to commit to that because it is a commitment and you are responsible in the end, even though you sell that animal to somebody, it's your responsibility um, to make sure that that animal goes to a good home and that it's well cared for. Um, same can be true, I'd be interested as well. Okay. Um, what's the other important thing that I wanted to talk about as far as animal responsibility? Yeah, just, you know, don't overstep your land capabilities. Um, Cause that, a lot of people fought really hard for this egg code to be changed and to allow things. The government doesn't understand what we're doing. They don't get it. They don't get it. The best thing you can do is make a farm plan, try to stick to it and make sure that you don't cause trouble because when the government goes to make rules for us and I'm not, you know, I'm not like hardcore Republican, hardcore Democrat. I'm not any of this. I'm a, I am a humanitarian. I do what I think humans should do. And I, but I use sensibility and I'm not like, well, this is my right. This is my land. Rah, rah, rah. No, you know, we all have to stay in a line that's reasonable and we can't be causing problems for other people. So um, just don't, please don't cause problems that make them make more rules on us that make it harder for us because then we have to fight again and we don't want to do that. So. So that's my little speech on how to be a good <laughs> arm person. Um, I want to be really cognizant of the time because we're pushing up on 12 o'clock. So um, I feel like you covered almost every single thing that was in that resource packet, which again, thank you, Ronnie, for putting that together. That was a huge brain dump and amazing information that can be shared out. Um, and so you all should have received that in that email reminder for the meeting today, but I will go ahead and send it out again in the follow-up email. I'm also going to be sending out just a quick survey. If you guys don't mind taking that, it'll be like a two minute survey, just asking some basic questions about your experience with Dirt Talk. Um, the event itself, it is our first one and we would like to be doing this quarterly um, on different topics. And we really would like input from you guys, especially since you guys are our test people on this um, to see what your um, experience was. Um, and then also I, I do have two additional documents that I will send out with that email. Um, one is actually specific, it's a WSU publication, it's specific to biosecurity and agritourism. So for those of you who are interested in that route, that's a really great document. Um, and then Ronnie did share out another document that I did not get attached to that resource guide, but I will send out that as well. 
so you have that full information. Um, and please, please make sure to contact Ronnie if you do have further questions. Um, I want to make sure, though, we we connected with everything that you guys wanted to talk about today. So we can open it up now if there, if you had any um, jot down questions that you didn't get answered during the, the call, um, now would be a great time to pop in and have that conversation. And if you're on mute and you're not sure how to unmute yourself, it's on the bottom um, of your screen and it should be uh, mute and unmute with a little microphone. Um, and I will be sending out um, this uh, video as well for anybody who's interested in reviewing it. It will include the chat box information. And I will try and remember to also include Ronnie's email and the vet information and some of those particular pieces of contact information for you also, so that you have that. Anybody have any other further questions or discussion topics they want to touch on before we sign off? Oh, I have one more thing that I wrote a note that I forgot. I didn't include in the resource guide. If you have a weathered animal, which is a castrated male, they have a different nutritional need than other animals in the fact that they don't, they want concentrates, but they really shouldn't have grain at all. Um, they should just have hay and access to freeze choice minerals and baking soda. Um, you can give them a little treat every now and then. If you are going to give them grain, it has to be balanced out with a phosphate like, oh, is it the phosphate? I can't remember which part it is, but like an alfalfa pellet. It has to be alfalfa pellet um, that goes with your grain. They just, they really shouldn't have much of anything. Um, they can get um, urinary calci, calculi on something called the pizzle. If you don't know about the pizzle, it's kind of a fun little straw thing that they have on their male parts um, that can become blocked with little tiny minerals and is a very painful death. Um, you cannot catheterize uh, a, a ruminant. And uh, so this goes for goats and sheep. So if you keep weathers, um, please do not give them grain. There is some stuff called ammonium chloride that um, people can give. It's supposed to dissolve the stones, but in, uh, I haven't had any experiences luckily, but, um, in my understanding of reading about this, that stuff is few and far between as far as working. And by the time you have a calculi giving them the, that, that stuff is too late. So some people have luck cutting off the pizzle, but um, I don't really wanna go there. But anyways, just know that if you're gonna have weathers, maybe you wanna check it out. And also if you're gonna keep your animals on pasture or freely roaming, make sure that you do not have any azaleas or rhododendrons and if you need to look up poisonous plants, there is a link in here for Fiasco Farm, F-A-I-S, and then C-O, Fiasco Farm. Um, it's on the last page, or it's on page 12. It's on the bottom of page 12. They have a poisonous um, list of what ruminants can eat. I keep that on my cell phone. It's bookmarked on my cell phone. So anyways, thank you all for coming. This was really fun. I hope you enjoyed it, and I know it was a ton of information, and just think all oh, that I keep in my brain, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And we very much appreciate Ronnie sharing all of this great info. Yeah, it was fun. And as you can tell, she's very passionate about what she does, so um, I don't, I don't want to like volunteer you, Ronnie, but again, I'm, I'm super excited that you're willing to share that with people um, who want to follow up with you, so thank you for that as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, we'll be sending out um, all of that information and in a follow-up email today for you guys. And please do reach out to Ronnie if you have further questions or want to connect with her on something specific. And um, take that survey that we'll be sending out with that email that would help us out greatly for WSU and the Kids Up Community and Agricultural Alliance so that we can know what your experience was and, and how we can better this experience for future presentations. So thank you all for joining us and please stay safe and uh, take care. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. bye.